In 2007, a man decided to die. Heartbroken over a breakup, he swallowed 29 pills of an antidepressant he was helping to test in a clinical trial. By the time he reached the emergency room, his symptoms screamed overdose. Blood pressure collapsed to 80 over 40. Heart rate soared to 110 beats per minute. His body trembled. He lay in his hospital bed, thinking his life was hanging by a thread. Just then, the doctor in charge of the drug trial arrived. He leaned over and calmly told the man one simple fact. He was in the control group of the experiment, and the 29 pills he considered poison were just sugar pills without any active ingredients. A miracle happened. Within 15 minutes, his blood pressure returned to normal, and all the symptoms of poisoning disappeared like a tide. A drama of poisoning directed by belief came to an abrupt end the moment that belief was broken. This case, later known as the nocebo effect, reflects a disturbing yet astonishing secret deep within the human mind. Is belief alone enough to create disease, even simulate death? To trace the roots of that question, we must travel back more than half a century to the Anzio beaches, where army surgeon Henry Beecher first encountered this mysterious force. Faced with the desperate situation of morphine running out and wounded soldiers screaming in agony, he filled syringes with saline and told the soldiers that it was a painkiller. As a result, more than one-third of the soldiers felt real relief after being injected with this saline, which had no pharmacological effect. In the heat of war, belief had shown the strength of morphine. At first, scientists thought it was just a mental trick, a hypnotic effect created by words and ritual. But they soon discovered that this invisible healer was far more powerful than they had imagined, and it even could shake the cornerstone of modern medicine, surgery. From 1995 to 1998, American orthopedic surgeon Dr. Mosley performed fake knee surgeries on arthritis patients. The patients were anesthetized, their knees were cut open, and the doctors created the sounds of instruments operating. However, the doctors never actually repaired anything, simply sewed up the wounds and told the patients that the surgery was a success. Incredibly, these patients, who only had scars, recovered just as well as those who had real procedures. This led Harvard's Kapchak to realize that perhaps we've been using the wrong word all along. The core of the placebo effect might not be the authenticity of the drug at all, but the meaning created by the therapeutic ritual. Anthropologist Mormon calls this the meaning response. To prove this, Kapchuk recruited a group of patients suffering from chronic back pain and then gave them a bottle of pill labeled placebo, clearly stating it was a sugar pill. This sounds like a paradox. How can a magic trick that's been exposed still work? Yet, weeks later, these patients, who knew they were taking a fake pill, reported real relief. Why? Because Kapchuk carefully crafted a framework of meaning. The compassionate consultation, the emphasis on the potential for self-healing, and the symbolic ritual of taking the pill itself. Altogether, they created a new belief that the patient was working toward a healthier future and had a professional supporting them. This meaning was enough to mobilize the brain's inner resources to begin healing itself. So how do these beliefs do this? In 1978, John Levine found the answer. He gave a group of patients who had just had their wisdom teeth removed a placebo injection, and many of them experienced pain relief. Levine then gave these patients a second injection of naloxone, a morphine antidote. It acts like a deadlock key, directly occupying the opioid receptors in the brain, rendering morphine, heroin, and all other opioids ineffective. Instantly, the pain returned to those patients who had just been immersed in comfort. Levine proved that the placebo effect is not a psychological illusion, but a physiological drama led by the brain and starring real chemicals. When we believe that the treatment is effective, the brain generously releases its own morphine, endorphins. Belief actually becomes a chemical in the brain. Since belief can create healing from nothing, can it also create sickness? The man who swallowed the sugar pill at the beginning of the story, as well as a series of patients with functional neurological disorders who became paralyzed and blind without warning, yet their nervous systems remained intact. All demonstrate the dark side of beliefs. Their brains, guided by trauma, anxiety, or a false sense of body perception, form a powerful prediction. 
Something is wrong with me. This prediction is so strong that it hijacks the body's normal signals, causing the body to play out a tragedy of its own making. This also explains one of the most common and torturous types of faulty scripts, chronic pain. For many people with chronic pain, the initial injury has long since healed, but the pain persists. Why? Because their brains are trapped in a vicious cycle of faulty predictions. Based on past experience, the brain continuously predicts that pain will occur. This prediction can cause individuals to become paranoid about any bodily signal. Any normal bodily sensation, even a slight sore muscle or a crackling joint, can be misinterpreted by the brain as a pain signal. This in turn reinforces the brain's initial prediction. See, I already knew it hurts here. The brain uses an outdated script to trap people in their painful past. So if the brain is a predictive machine that automatically writes scripts, how can we avoid being trapped by its faulty scripts or even consciously rewrite them? This is the core of humanity's greatest meaning-making project, which religions and ancient wisdom have been exploring for thousands of years. In a sense, the core of all religions is an ultimate structured system of beliefs and rituals, a solemn mass, a pious pilgrimage, a solemn chant. These transcend surgical procedures in complexity and sensory saturation. They are the highest level of will stimulators, creating a profound belief as, I am saved, I am blessed, and I am one with the divine. The impact of this conviction is naturally far greater than a sugar pill can ever match. While most religions instill beliefs through powerful external rituals, Buddhism offers a unique path to crack and reconstruct beliefs from within. It believes that the root of suffering does not come from the external world, but from our attachment to our own thoughts. We mistake the thoughts and predictions that flash through our minds for irrefutable reality. The core of mindfulness training is to cultivate the ability to detach, to observe our thoughts without judgment, to watch them arise and fade away without being tied to them. That is how you escape the brain's predictions. When you can clearly see that the drama within you and find that it is just a thought, not the self, you are freed from the script of belief and gain the freedom to see things as they are. Multiple studies have shown that long-term positive meditation practitioners can consciously reduce activity in the brain's default mode network, the neural basis that spins our endless internal stories. At last, we can finally demystify belief. It's not superstition, but the fundamental workings of our brain's predictive machine, an operating system that can be designed, observed, and calibrated. From placebos to nocebos, from fake surgeries to religious rituals, we see the same force at work. After all, human suffering transcends the purely physiological. It's layered within our memories, fears, beliefs, and expectations. This means that human well-being depends not only on external medicine and surgery, but also, at a deeper level, on our ability to construct an internal script that is healthier, more honest, and more adaptive. We ultimately cannot control what happens in our lives, but we always have the ability to use the power of creation and belief within our brains to heal, to hope, and to change reality itself.